there's any advantage to being the last speaker in the last session of the last day of a conference. <laughs> I'm not convinced that there is, but it's that one can try to make sense of what we've been hearing for the last couple of days. And so for me, what this paper is going to try to do is weave together the strands of the conference method, history, and practice. They're deeply intertwined already, as you can imagine, in the way we research history influences its telling. And the corollary to that is that there can be the danger that we only find the stories that we go looking for. But as the title of this conference suggests, we do indeed imagine history and in that way bring it into being. So let's begin first with the, with the history strand. So Emma Lake is, considered, is located in what is considered to be northern Saskatchewan, but is in fact much closer to the geographic center of the province here. The little diagram at the top. You can imagine my beloved trapezoid continuing on <laughs> much farther. And the population in Saskatchewan, like the rest of Canada, is you know, pressed up against the glass of the United States and, and compressed into urban centers. But there are people in the north, and no less than 100,000 lakes, of which Emma is one. And this particular lake was the site of Canada's first outdoor university art class, taught by Canada's first artist in residence, Augustus Kenderheim. It was named after the university's founding president, Walter Murray, whose remarkable vision this was. I think I need to say here parenthetically that this was all happening you know, on the eve of the Second World War. The crisis in, in Europe was pretty evident to people even at this time during the darkest days of the Great Depression in the 30s, which of course hit Saskatchewan harder than many other regions in Canada. So it really is remarkable that this is where resources were chosen to be allocated at this time. So the school came to be known as Murray Point, the location of the school <coughs> and the school itself, the Murray Point Art School. From 1936, when the school first officially began, um, till 1955, it catered mostly to art teachers from throughout the province and featured another first for a Canadian university, the integration of studio art instruction with art history, which hadn't been done before. And this was accomplished in the early years through the coordination of Gus Kenderdine right here and Dr. Gordon Snellgrove as art historian. So Gus Kenderdine is the studio instructor and Dr. Gordon Snellgrove is the art historian who may have been, as far as I can tell, thus far, the first PhD artist in Canada as well, and another first. But in 1955, following Kindergarten's death in 47, and a series of different instructors over the years, um, and apparently a falling away of that art history component, the artist's workshops were instigated. These are distinct from the art school, the artist workshops. These were shorter sessions than what was typically the six-week summer art school. They were usually about two weeks in duration, and they were intended exclusively for professional artists, as opposed to the art teachers that we just heard about. These ran concurrent with the art school up to about 1970, when the art school itself ended. And then uh, the workshops became the primary activity at MLA, which is now known as the Kenderdine Campus until about 1988, when, when the whole enterprise ended. So hopefully, for the reasons I've just outlined with that quick history, for those of you who aren't that familiar with Emily, and for no other reason than that list of firsts uh, that I gave you, I hope you'll agree with me that the whole enterprise, I think, is quite significant and worthy of investigation. But it's the workshops that tend to get the most press. And this is for, I think, the obvious reason that likely that they were the conduit for the New York School of Modernism. Um, when specific artists were invited to lead the workshops, Barnett Newman famously said of his invitation, where the hell is Saskatchewan and who is Emma Lake? Right? <laughs> but come they did, nonetheless. Uh, Jack Shadbolt, Joseph Plaskett, Barnett Newman, as I said, Kenneth Nolan, Jules Olitsky, John Cage, interestingly, Mary Stella, Anthony Carroll, and of course, most notoriously, most infamously, Clement Greenberg. Many, though not indeed all of these artists, invited artists and critics formed lifelong relationships, friendships, and attachments with Saskatchewan, 
and Saskatchewan artists. And I think it's important to recognize that Emma Lake became, in a time before instant digital global access to art and art production, a really important conduit of communication, a really important means of communication and community between artists who were very self-conscious, one might even say anxious, about their modernity. Right? So it was important for them to be in contact with what was going on, to know what was going on with each other. I've titled this talk, Emma Lake Revisited, however, because the second piece of that, of that brief history, is the way in which the workshops in particular have been viewed. On the one hand, I say somewhat misleadingly in my abstract that the workshops have loomed large in Canadian art history, but this is really only true in relative terms because um, the workshops are the one piece of art history, of Saskatchewan art history, that shows up in Canadian art surveys when Saskatchewan is mentioned at all. But locally, on the other hand, the interesting phenomenon is this, that I found in my own education at the undergraduate level in Saskatchewan, and this would have been 25 years ago now, just when the workshops were ending, the whole enterprise was ending, that Emma Lake was viewed, I would characterize it as, certainly quite dismissively, even disparagingly. And I think, you know, with the benefit of age and wisdom and hindsight, I think that the modernist influences were seen as an embarrassment in a postmodern world, not sufficiently up to date. There was the sense that Greenberg was sexist, people were told what to paint, you know, that's the end of the story, that's all you need to know about the Emma Lake workshops. And my experience, as it turned out, um, well, my sense of that case was not unique. In research for a larger project of which this is part, a graduate student of mine conducted interviews with um, artists and teachers who had been uh, at Emma Lake and at the university. And one person recounted um, coming across students talking about an assignment on Clement Greenberg that they were assigned to work on and uh, they were asked which of the essays they were critiquing, to which they replied, oh, no, 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 we're not supposed to read anything that Greenberg wrote. We're only supposed to read people who are critical of him. <laughs> so when I returned to Saskatchewan as a faculty member and embarked on a larger project on Saskatchewan visual culture, I was also again told effectively, Emma Lake's been done to death. Right? But the uh, literature review simply doesn't bear that out. It isn't broad or, or deep in any way. And this is surprising to me for a number of reasons. And, and I think it's something that needs to be more deeply studied. So how do we expand that partial view that I deliberately kept you hostage to here? This little <laughs> small frame of Clement Greenberg in that view. Uh, how do we expand that? With a clicker, for one. And I would argue that, especially following the theoretical explosion of the last 40 years, there's an even greater need to return to the archival project, to return to the archives in ways that we've seen done brilliantly over the last couple of days in a number of the, the papers that I've been privileged to hear. And to reconsider in an informed, theoretically informed way, for sure, the primary sources. <laughs> particularly those ones that have gotten short shrift. It seems obvious to say, but I think we've been pulled away from it in a number of ways, at least historians have. The two primary sources that I have considered thus far in this project, I think of as memory and artifact. The artifacts, we'll start with those, are, are the tangible pieces of evidence, as I like to think of them, that I've been examining are called the Emma Lake scrapbooks. But they're in fact yearbooks, in scrapbook form, um, which were produced right from the beginning <coughs> of the first camp in 1936, and they run until 1972. The run is not complete, there's some that are missing. Whether that's because they were never produced, or they have not ever been turned into the archive, or lost, it's, it's impossible to say. And they're interesting, I think, um, especially in the early years, when they were taken very seriously, and a lot of effort was put into them, they became a very self-conscious tradition at the school, and as a result, they developed consistent attributes, which you can then compare 
year to year. Things like conversations, effectively conversations between students and their instructors in the form of messages between, you know, little statements from the, the student executive or statements from the instructors sort of back and forth. You can compare those. Also, um, diary-like records of the atmosphere and activities of the camp. Significantly, once a, a yearbook was completed, it had a particular route that it was supposed to travel through the province to be passed hand to hand to all the people who had been at that camp in that year. And then it would be returned to the art school where it would take its place on the library shelf with all the preceding year's books. And it's clear in examining them that the past yearbooks were referenced and traditions at the camp maintained in part through the record that the yearbooks themselves constituted. So it's this wonderful sort of cyclical self-perpetuating thing. So what can we learn from this record? I'll drink a dramatic pause. <laughs> so what can we, what did we see? What's there? Well, the first is very simply, but, in, but significantly, that there were a lot of women present, which again, is not the conventional wisdom about the lake, particularly the workshops, right? But we don't really consider the art school. It's really staggering to see the vast majority that women comprised in terms of attendees at the art school. Even excluding, even if you factor in the war years and the obvious reduction in male participation that this might have led to, you can factor that out, it really was a very female space. So we're talking about three, six on, art school on. Now, again, another sort of caveat is you can factor out the warriors. I think it's still a female space, even if you factor out the fact that the male instructors and the fact that the few men who did attend often became leaders of the executive. Right here you see a a Jimmy Dean-esque Otto Rogers <laughs> as, as the VP, as the VP of the, uh, of the student executive. And that, to me, that power relationship alone between men and women at the art school is, is worthy of more uh, investigation. But what I was interested at this point in the research is how women were represented in the yearbooks. see the first picture and that's the context of the scrapbook and how it's shown. So what do we see when we look for that? How are women represented in the yearbooks? Well, we see lots of um, references to the mores of femininity that were prevalent at the time. Gosh, I <laughs> References to the absence of men at the camps. But overall, so you've got sort of these, these images of sort of stereotypical femininity. But overall, one gets the sense, historically speaking, of a giant, I'll use a Western metaphor here, which is appropriate, of a giant art hopper in which you throw hundreds of women year after year after year, and out comes the Regina Five. <laughs> <laughs> right? Just, you know, here in all their mad men glory. <laughs> and, and the middle three, McKay, Morton, and Lockheed, were instructors at the art school in the post Kenderdine years. So, this is the conventional picture in terms of people's conception of Emma Lake and Saskatchewan art more generally, it should be said. But this is precisely, again, the partial view that Mary Sheriff costumed us against in, in the keynote. So I'm interested in this phenomenon, this partial view, and this effect, um, in particular because four very significant women artists, Saskatchewan women artists, also participated in the Emma Lake experience, initially through the art school and then through the artist workshops. Winona Mulcaster, Rita Cowley, Dorothy Knowles, and Maya Forsyth. And you can find them, interestingly, in the pages of these yearbooks in their first participations. Shy Dorothy Knowles here, for the chicken in her cabin group on the right, Billy Mulcaster, Maya Forsyth, self portrait quickly done. And the later ones are much more um, hastily put together than the later ones. 
And in the case of Rita Cowley, you can trace her trajectory from student to instructor to ultimately director of the school. For a number of years, she took on that role. So to understand the art school better, we think MLA, we think professional workshops, but to come back to its origins and to understand the art school better is one of the aims of this project, in part because it, I think it now seems evident to me that it's the very feminine nature of that space, of the school, um, which is one of the reasons why it's been overlooked, I think, in comparison to the professional artist workshops. The art school is more significant, I think, than it's been given credit for, because all the women mentioned, those four, and many other artists besides, got their start here. Quite literally, it's no small thing when you consider the repercussions of literally hundreds of art teachers, primary, secondary, post-secondary, over many years, being influenced by this place and this relatively consistent experience. Dorothy Knowles told me, that it would not be an exaggeration for me to say to you that her first attendance at the MLA Art School in 1948, sorry, 1948 was absolutely formative to her becoming an artist at all. So this brings me to the second kind of primary source, the testimony of the women who were there. Admittedly, memory is shifting and shifty, but not to be summarily dismissed on those counts alone, I think, we have to somehow integrate subject's testimony into the theoretical perspective. Or, or wait, do we? Can we not just take it on its own terms rather than try to make it fit our preconceptions or biases? For example, I wanted to talk to Dorothy Knowles and her daughter Catherine Fowler, her Mikhail Rudolph, both of whom studied several times in MLA, about the sort of this atmosphere of sexism that I assumed or that I had been told surrounded the, the artist workshops. And a few key points from their oral history stood out for me. The first was Dorothy's surprise in my account from my review of the yearbooks as I was presenting this material to her and talking to her that there had been any male participants at all. <laughs> she was, really, there were men there? She said, no, I didn't. I didn't remember that. <laughs> she reports being personally much more focused on her art than the activities of camp life, which is something that the scrapbooks do focus on. And she seemed to intimate to me that there, for her at least personally, there was a distinction between the two. She was there to do art, even when she didn't consider herself to yet be an artist, versus the people that were there for something of the camp life itself. The second one. was then moving on to the workshops, so that's the art school, moving on to the workshops, was her description of the artist workshops as being like a nursery, in that children and families were an abundant part of their time spent there, which created for her, in particular, an atmosphere that enabled her work, which is mother of two small children, <laughs> was a very meaningful comment for me. I appreciate that that's no small thing. It was, in short, by her account, a very family-friendly environment, which has huge implications, as well, I think, as contradictions for women um, and women artists at this time, something we can talk about further. Finally, on the specific reputation of Clement Greenberg's chauvinism, she was quite adamant that she had never experienced it herself. Nor, she said, had any of the women artists with whom she was familiar. The waitress might get it, she noted, but not women artists. This, her testimony, right, which we can't dismiss, is actually consistent with the primary sources, but again, not with the conventional wisdom that tends to stop at the intentionally provocative introductory statements and not go on farther into the sources, or even to the sources themselves at all. I mean, there's lots you can say about this, <laughs> but there's actually lots of interesting things to say about it as well. Indeed, uh, Greenberg goes on in this particular Gazette article 
to single out Dorothy Knowles as the best landscape painter in Canada. She took her <coughs> to be a, a strong supportive advocate for her. That was sort of her testimony of her relationship with him. However, it's that qualifier, landscape artist, that's still troubling and, and significant. Because the interesting fact remains that the Saskatchewan women artists who participated in Emma Lake tended toward representational or landscape work and continued that pursuit throughout their careers and lifetimes, while the prominent men, including Dorothy Knowles' own husband, William Perkuda, whom Greenberg describes in the same article, as sings him out as well, as second only to Jack Bush, a terrific painter. He's a terrific painter, not a terrific abstract painter or a terrific male painter, but just a terrific painter. Um, so the men pursued formalist abstraction by and large, while the women pursued landscape or representational work. Dorothy Knowles told me that Greenberg had encouraged her turn toward nature, but could not testify as to what might have been said, perhaps in contrast to her husband, and seemed kind of puzzled by, by that question. I don't know what was said to him, I know what was said to me, which I thought was a, a, a great rebuttal to that. So what does all this lead me to conclude about art history and methodology? Well, specifically regarding the history of Emma Lake, it was, I think, without question, a significant site of art education and women's art education in particular. And I think in ways, when I reflect on that, in ways that really haven't been sufficiently examined. Again, just to reiterate this point, because I think it's worth, worth impressing upon you, the impact and implications of literally hundreds of women learning art in a particular way, in a particular place, for more than 30 years with the art school, mm -hmm. and 50 years, if you can continue to include the artist workshop, can, you just can't overstate that, especially when you add on to that the careers that these women went on to have as art teachers, university professors, and in the case of the four women that I highlighted for you, practicing successful artists themselves. Their influence, their perspective, and their legacy, I think, has had a lasting impact on generations of people in art production in Saskatchewan and beyond. And all of this, in my view, again, deserves greater attention. So I would ultimately conclude with a reflection on the third strand of the conference practice, and I came across a very useful caution when I was doing my PhD research and that has remained with me ever since. It was um, while exploring the overly simplified notion of separate spheres for women and men in Victorian England. The cultural historian Amanda Vickery said that contemporary scholars have been far more bamboozled by Victorian propaganda than the Victorians themselves <laughs> ever were. <laughs> And, I, and I, that really struck with me. My sense is that we too have been bamboozled by an academic reaction to Emma Lake, to its modernism, to Clement Greenberg, that is less subtle, less nuanced, and ultimately less illuminating than it needs to be to accurately reflect the experiences of the women who are actually there. My way to revisit Emma Lake is through a refusal to swallow a priori the theoretical positions and recommit to the often laborious work, let's go back to the scrapbooks, the often, unfortunately, laborious work of the archival enterprise, and to support, <coughs> especially now, in our current climate, the extraordinary effort and expertise of the archivists, <laughs> who, who against what I consider to be very short-sighted public policy, who struggle against that to preserve for us the um, artifacts and ultimately the memory that is our most reliable means for imagining history.